Hi everyone, hopefully you can all hear me, sounds good. Uh, awesome, as Aparna said, my name's Alex and I'm team leader here at uh, Bloomberg for the uh, Cross Commodities team. Uh, we're responsible for uh, discoverability of uh, commodities and run uh, both a front-end uh, Python stack as well as a RabbitMQ Python pipeline uh, in the background as well. And uh, I've recently come across GraphQL and I want to talk uh, about my journey uh, of learning uh, about GraphQL and trying to inspire more of you to go out, find out about it, because I think it's a really cool uh, technology. And this presentation is really given from the point of view of an enthusiastic beginner. I've written a couple of example script uh, servers, try to get to know it. I'm currently writing a proof of concept internally as well uh, before trying to persuade uh, the rest of my team to use it. So hopefully today I can inspire you to go and learn a little bit more about it. Uh, the slides are all online. Uh, the example code is online as well. Um, and I'll tweet about it uh, later at Alex Chamberlain as well. So as I said, uh, I'm really looking to inspire you to write some GraphQL uh, servers in Python and signpost you towards some fantastic open source uh, libraries that are available now uh, for you to use. So GraphQL is a, uh, an API technology that's come out of Facebook. I'm not going to read the definition to you um, there. It's available on graphql.org. Um, but essentially, GraphQL comes in two parts, a schema definition language that defines the uh, contract between your client and your server. I am going to talk about that uh, quite a lot because I think it's quite important. And a uh, query language for actually um, defining what you want as a client uh, from the server. So you can kind of think of the query language as your SQL uh, data manipulation type stuff and your uh, schema language in a similar way to your data definition language in SQL. They're kind of uh, comparable. So this is an example uh, query. You'll notice that uh, you can name queries. In, the case, in this case, it's, it's named country there. You have operations uh, on which uh, that you want to call, so we're calling the country API. You have arguments that are always uh, keyword arguments that are always specified by name. And in this case, we're, we're passing in the string US. Uh, that's a two character ISO code there. And then what makes GraphQL different from most of the uh, query languages out there is you then tell, it, uh, tell the server, hey, as a client for my use case, I need these fields returned. So in this case, I need uh, ISO code, name, and a list of cities that are, belong to this country. And I'm going to keep reusing this example throughout the presentation. So I'll refer to uh, city API. It's just a sort of basic idea. You can kind of imagine that it exposes accesses for city objects, for country objects, and the links between them, because it just, it, it's, it's a good use case for GraphQL. This is another example, um, just to point out a couple of the other features that you can have. In this case, uh, you can see that arguments can support many different types. In the first case, we used a string argument. In this case, we're using uh, an integer. You can have aliases for any field. So in this case, the first uh, query is alias to London, the second query to, to New York. And that's supported throughout the query. So if I wanted to rename name as label or something to that effect, uh, prefixing it with that alias would work. And each uh, key has to be unique, uh, which sometimes makes aliasing necessary. The arguments can also be complex types. They're called input types if you want to go and look them up. Uh, but I won't really be talking about them too much uh, today. So the GraphQL basics. As I said, uh, GraphQL really starts with a schema definition language. This is where you define what types your uh, schema use. And GraphQL is really built around its type system. Uh, type system is quite powerful. And I'll show you an example of uh, the schema uh, in a bit. The schema defines your contract between your client and your server. 
Well, I think this is a really important thing, and it's very important for schema-driven uh, or schema-first design, where you sit down and you define your schema. That's not to say that you never change it again. Schemas obviously evolve as, as the use cases evolve. But it's really a uh, useful uh, methodology to get yourself into about thinking about, OK, so I've got my server. What's my interface to my server? And I think that's a really massive benefit. Uh, we've been using uh, schema-first design here at Bloomberg for quite a while, and I must say, it really does speed up development. Um, you have your basic root types. These are the basic operations that a GraphQL server can support. Read-only operations, such as the queries, read-write operations in the mutation, and there is some now so getting some basic support around subscriptions as well. Uh, so that's where, basically, it's a kind of pub-sub mechanism. Typically, but not absolutely necessary for GraphQL. Um, the query and mutations would be served over HTTP. The vast majority of examples out there are going to be HTTP based, and the subscription would be over WebSockets. But the actual GraphQL spec doesn't really talk about transport. The transport is really a, a, a convention that's built up over time. So if you have a different request response protocol that you use at your corporation, GraphQL still works. If you have a different pub sub or you want to publish your pub sub over Rabbit or over Kafka, that still works too. One other really important thing that I'm going to talk about is resolvers. So whilst the spec, again, doesn't actually specify how you go about implementing your server, your server could just be serving up static files for all, uh, all the spec uh, cares about. And in mock servers, that probably is what you're actually going to do. But most um, implementations out there use a resolver pattern, where uh, a function or a resolver is called for each field. And I think it's quite important to understand uh, those resolvers. So this is a little bit Python specific, but the JavaScript examples and most other examples have very similar uh, patterns as well. A GraphQL resolver is, is just a function. Uh, it typically takes uh, two um, positional arguments. The source, that's the object that this field is being resolved for. So at the top, that's probably going to be none. Okay, You're just saying, I want to call this city API at the root level. But as you go down your tree, as you go into the fields on the city type or on the country type, that's going to uh, become a sort of real object that you might want to reference. The resolve info, which has loads of information, uh, most of which you'll never use uh, in a typical use case, um, but it provides a space where you can share information across your resolvers. So that's your context, if you like. And our, in the example code, we share our database connection uh, via the context uh, mechanism. And the field name, which is really useful, um, as I'll show you in a second, for the default resolver. The arguments from the client get passed in as keyword arguments. These are already being validated. They're already of the correct type. Um, so you can trust, you can trust that. You know, that comes from the libraries for free. Um, and, and it'll be according to the schema as well. And then your response to your client comes in in the form of the result. So at a high level, that might be a, a value semantic object, an object you're returning to the client, or it could, um, could be a scalar type, either one of the native ones supported, like string, flow, int, that type of thing, or a scalar type that you've defined. So one of the uh, schemas I've worked on recently, we defined a, a UUID or GUID uh, scalar object, because a lot of our IDs uh, took that form. And then re resolvers kind of recurse into themselves. So the first resolver you get called might return a city object, the whole object that represents the, the, the city row in the database. Whereas um, when you're populating the name field on that city uh, object, the source becomes that city object. It recurses into that. And then um, you return a scalar value from that, presumably a string um, for the name. And of course, at the lowest level, most of the resolvers actually look exactly the same. You know, you've gone to your database, you've constructed your city object, you've constructed your, your uh, country object, and you just want to return the, the value that's on that attribute. And so the default resolver provides that for you. But the reason I've copied it here is it, it provides a nice illustration of some of the things you can do uh, with the resolve info. So the resolve info, you can access the field name. So if you want the same resolver across multiple field names and they might maybe have a slightly different implementation, that information is available for you. It also shows that the default resolver in the Python stack 
uh, uses eight attribute notation or dot notation. There's no good returning a dictionary. The default resolver is not going to work for you. You need to use first class objects or override the default uh, resolver. That took me a couple of minutes to figure out the first time. So let's move on to the pros and cons. So this isn't necessarily uh, Python specific at this point. But of course, when you're trying to sell a new idea to a bunch of engineers, what do they first do? And they go, oh, you know, that might work for 95% of our use cases, but it doesn't work for the other 5%, so we can't use it. So they're going to list all the cons off for you first. So these are a few of the cons that I could think of. And of course, we're at a uh, Python conference. And the first thing I noticed about the GraphQL ecosystem, it's largely JavaScript. You Google GraphQL, most of your example is going to be JavaScript. Most of the tutorials are in JavaScript. Most of the clients are in JavaScript. Now, that's great if you're a web developer. But if you're trying to apply it to other technologies, that may feel a little bit alienating to start with. Uh, but I'd like to start by reassuring you that the ecosystems in the other languages are, um, are equally thriving as well. It just started in, in the JavaScript space. And the other pet peeve of mine, I told you I'd mentioned the schema quite a lot, is uh, many examples conflate the schema with the business logic. So they might define the schema in code rather than using the schema definition language. And that makes it really hard if you're the other side of the coin. So if you're the server developer, fine. I don't have to define my schema twice. I just do it in code. And when I add a new attribute, it just magically appears in the schema. But imagine that you're the client. How do I go and find the schema? Well, wait, I have to connect to your server, download the schema, decode the schema into the schema definition language, and read it. That's really difficult. So by providing the schema up front, you're doing two things. You're agreeing that contract with the client, and you're providing them with the service that they deserve. You're providing them with that documentation that they need as, as your client. Why should we use GraphQL? Well, it's slowly becoming an industry standard. Um, I went onto the GraphQL uh, website to do a little bit of research for this, and they actually list off a variety of companies using it. So it started at Facebook, but GitHub has a GraphQL API as well. Pinterest, Intuit, Coursera, and Shopify are also using it as well. And hopefully one day I'll add Bloomberg to that list. There are conferences around for GraphQL. Um, the GraphQL Europe conference is actually in a few weeks' time. Uh, unfortunately, I can't make it. Um, Meteor provide consultancy services around uh, their Apollo ecosystem. And there's even a back end of a, as a service called GraphCool. Um, that was such a cool name. They've recently changed it to Prisma um, as well, um, providing, as I said, a back end as a service. So you don't even have to run your own infrastructure if you don't want to. There's a strongly typed schema. One of the big uh, criticisms that REST APIs often get is like, what objects am I going to get back? Oh, just query the API and see what you get. Well, that's kind of not good enough, to be honest. Um, the the uh, strongly typed schema gives you those guarantees that you need. No more over or under fetching. Again, one of the big criticisms of microservices is well, because this service has to be reused across a lot of clients. You either give me too much data, i.e. over fetching, that could be slow, it could use up the bandwidth, it could expose data that that client just doesn't need, which in sort of GDPR terms is a really bad thing. Um, or it could not give you enough data, i.e. underfetching. So this is a typical problem where you get a list of IDs back, and for each ID, you have to go and make another API request, i.e. the n plus 1 problem. GraphQL solves this by saying, hey, tell me what information you need up front. If you need the cities that belong to a country, tell me that, and tell me the information you need on those cities, and I'll give it back to you in one go. Now, the server might have to make loads more queries to the database to do that, but at least it's all contained in one place, and if it proves costly enough, the back-end engineers can optimize it. I hope so. Um, rapid product development. So. The rapid product development, again, comes from this schema. The schema's agreed up front. Uh, the clients can go away and uh, say, look, let me bring up a mock server with fixed results just so I can get the client going while the, uh, you bring up uh, the real server behind it. And the back-end engineers can go away, write the server. Now, of course, those two engineers might be the same person in some cases, but it really decouples your development from your, your client and your, your back-end. Uh, it's composable. 
This is a relatively new idea, but if you've got the same entity represented in two GraphQL schemas, rather than the client having to go to both entities, say to go to one API to get the number of car parking spaces currently available in a city, and the other API to find out the location of the city, you might provide a composed or a merged layer in front of it, and uh, dynamically dispatch the request to those uh, two schemas themselves. And finally, there's a rich ecosystem. I, I am going to have to look at my notes for this one. So server libraries are, are available in C Sharp, Clojure, Elixir, Erlang, Go, Groovy, Java, PHP, Scala, and Ruby. Not to mention the fact that it all started in JavaScript, and there is a rich Node uh, ecosystem out there. And of course, there's a great Python ecosystem too. So the Python support is generally around uh, 23 repositories on the GraphQL Python organization on GitHub. I haven't actually had a chance to send a pull request their way yet, unfortunately. Um, and the main implementation, the query passing, the uh, schema definition passing, is all done in GraphQL core. And then there's loads of satellite libraries around it that um, implements various things, such as integration with common frameworks. Uh, so the example I'll be showing today is an uh, asynchronous one based on SANIC GraphQL. Um, but I know that there was a Django workshop yesterday, and there's a Graphene Django integration layer as well, that um, maybe you could go away and put a GraphQL um, API on the front of that uh, website you developed yesterday. Another library that I'm going to show you is called AIO Data Loader. And this is an asynchronous library. It's not specific to GraphQL but it allows you to um, separate the data fetching layer from everything else in your, um, your application. The API it exposes is a load API. You say uh, city loader dot load and then provide uh, the name of the city or whatever you want to load. And behind the scenes, it will batch up a bunch of these uh, calls together. And as, a, as an implementer, you implement the batch load function. So as I said, uh, the I illustrative example I'm just going to go quickly over is that of a city API. Make up the requirements in your head. There are city objects, there are country objects, there's links between them, they have some parameters. Uh, all the data uh, is Creative Commons from uh, the GeoNames uh, database. So what does the schema look like? Well, it's fairly, fairly simple. You start by defining what your types, types are. My country has an ISO code, it has a name. They're both strings. They're both required. That is, if the client says, hey, give me the name of this country, the API guarantees it will get one back. You can't send a null back in that case. But you only send it back if the, if the client asks for it. The city has a similar number of attributes. And then there's these relationship fields between them. A city has a, a single country. A country has multiple cities, and you can see that in the list uh, syntax. And of course, there's lots of documentation about writing schemas and uh, the, the intricacies of thereof. You can see the root type at the bottom, the query type, and the decla formal declaration of what our schema looks like. And so the schema also takes a mutation argument, a subscription argument, uh, where you can provide um, those types as well. Uh, but I've just implemented a read-only service in this case. Um, the loader, uh, the country loader, is relatively simple. As I said, uh, you can see the batch load function uh, that you'll never directly call. That's called by the uh, data loader uh, library. And you can see the resolver underneath. I chose to do it as a member uh, function, but it's, there's no, it's not necessary uh, if you don't want. And you can see the basic um, format of uh, context, resolve, info, and then the keyword arguments that the uh, client provided. Then this is where we tie up the schema. So you've got your schema file. I'm going to pass it and load it. I've got rid of the intricacies of that. If you want to have a look at the code there, uh, it's all on GitHub pass it, and then I've written this uh, make executable schema uh, utility that just connects the two together. So we've got our formal schema uh, uh, file. It's been carved in stone somewhere. The clients are uh, basing, um, 
basing their implementation on that. And then in code, we just say, hey, if you need a resolver for query country, use this resolver. You want a resolver for the cities, use this resolver. And it just connects them together. It's very simple. There are various other examples online uh, where uh, they're, they're set out slightly differently, such as uh, automatically giving you the resolvers based on a database um, schema and things like that. There are various ways to set, set this up. Uh, this is just uh, one example. And then the server. As I said, most of the integration between the GraphQL layer and the server has actually been done for you. Um, I'm just uh, telling it really, hey, you can go and find your schema here. And in this case, I've used the, um, the SANIC GraphQL uh, view to allow me to override the context. So like I said before, the database connection is shared across uh, all of the resolvers. You don't want to open a separate database connection for every field that you want to go and grab. And so, uh, I, uh, as I said, I override the context to that effect and provide the database and the loaders at, at that level. So let's uh, have a look at what it looks like. Um, so this is a little utility called gra uh, Graph IQL or Graph EQL. Pardon? Make it Can I make it bigger? Yes. That was lucky, wasn't it? Um, cool. So as you can see, I've got multiple queries here, and hopefully I've remembered to start my server. And just by hitting uh, Command Enter, it runs the query on my back end. This is really fast uh, iteration time. I you know, change the server, hit Enter, and I'm testing it again. And I've got a full suite of PyTest. Uh, they're all medium tests. They're all hit the database. Um, but you could write unit tests for it quite easily as well. Uh, in, in, the, um, in the repository uh, for everybody to have a look at. And with that, that brings me on nicely to my, uh, to my conclusion. So GraphQL is a fantastic way to define a contract between different parts of your system. It could be from your front end to your back end, from the UI service to your back end services. It could be between your RabbitMQ worker and your label translation system. Um, it's, just a, it's just a layer, um, a schema layer, a, a, an API language that you can use between different uh, actors in your system. And the ecosystems is great in a variety of languages. So you've got clients and servers in Python, but you've got them in all the, of the technologies you might be using uh, at your corporation as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. I'll be around after the talk, because I think I've used the full 25 minutes. Probably going to hang out for a bit at the uh, Bloomberg booth. If anybody wants to come and uh, talk to me about uh, GraphQL or about jobs at Bloomberg, I'd be happy to talk about either. Thank you.